Welcome to In the News for October the 13th, 2023. Uh, happens to be Friday the 13th, but that's a good thing for us. I'm Brett Birdie from AppsAndLaw.com. And this is Jeff Richardson from iPhone JD. A little spooky, too, because the month of Halloween. I don't know if that makes sense. Exactly. I'm, I'm more spooky Friday the 13th or what? Anyway. <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it. It's okay. Hey, Jeff, how has the charging gone for your brand new iPhone 15 Pro Max? <laughs> you had a good story here today about the fact that, um, that, you know, this has always been confusing to me. It's like, what's the best adapter? You know, some of us had that little tiny chiclet adapter that came with the old iPhones. You know, now there's bigger adapters. I just I never can read the fine print on those things of how many wattage or how many volts or whatever the heck is going to be on those things. But you linked to a good story today from Zach Hall at 9to5Mac uh, that uh, maybe the 20 watt power adapter is better than the 30 watt adapter. Did I read that right? Yeah, that's what the headline is. So uh, what can I tell you about this? What? <laughs> OK. A uh-huh. <laughs> little dad joke there. Um, the the best, you know. Char- charging is a whole different story with the new iPhone uh, 15 because okay. of the um, because of the USB-C connector in the bottom of it. And so um, things are a little okay, bit different yes. than with Lightning. Um, right. As before, I mean, people that have had iPhones for the last couple of years know that with better chargers, you can actually charge them faster, which is super nice if you want to get right. like, a lot of charge in a smart period of time. With the new iPhone 15s, you know, technically the best charger to use is a 30-watt charger, which is the one that, you know, you can often get access to because I want to say that the iPhone can get like 27 watts is the maximum it can suck up at one time. Okay. So if you've got yeah, a 30 that's what watt charger, the most. Right. But the interesting right. thing about Zach's article is when the test that he ran, he found that a 20 watt charger, which are a little bit cheaper and you can find them more readily, the 20 watt chargers, um, the difference is so minor between 20 and 30 watt that he's like, it's, it's re- you know, you're really fine oh, with either one of them. Okay. So, um, okay. so it's nice to know. I mean, this is, you and I have talked about this almost every week since the new iPhones have come out. The new <laughs> right. USB-C world that we're in is great right. but more confusing it really is because not every cord is equal not every charging thing is equal but um yeah so you need to pay attention to things that you never paid attention to before in the old days you had a lightning cable you were great you really had two choices either you had lightning to USB C, in which case you knew it was going to charge more slowly or, I mean, right. I mean, more more quickly or you had lightning right, to right, the right. old style usb and then it would charge more slowly um and that was it it was just really those two choices but now that we're in the USB C world of uh, for sure where everything is possible, you know, you just need to sort of pay attention about what speed your chargers are. And if you have one of these uh, these power uh, adapters like I do all over the place, I've got in my office, in my home, right. that have like multiple USB-Cs on a single charging brick, you know, it will send right. different right. amounts of power based upon how many things you have plugged in. So you just need to think about this. <laughs> yeah. um, so if you want to have a setup, whether it's at your home or your office or wherever, where you know you're going to charge your iPhone as fast as possible, then... A 30 watts is going to be great. And according to this article, 20 watts is going to be just about as good. Um, One thing that I don't think he even mentioned in this article, but it's worth noting, is that another change of the new iPhones is not only can the charge come in nice and fast, you can actually send the charge out. So if you can, for the first time, you can use your iPhone to charge another device. With with Lightning, I think that the power power that used to go out of the Lightning port was something like – it was less than a watch. It was like 0.3 or yeah, something like minimal, that. Right. But with the USB-C, it actually sends out, I want to say, almost five watts of power. It's like four point something. And so as a result, if, if you're in a pinch and your AirPods, for example, are dying or your Apple Watch is dying, you could actually plug into US, USB-C at the bottom of your phone. And, and then plug it. into your <laughs> something that would be a less power right. device, like your AirPods or your Apple um, Apple Watch, and you can actually give it a charge. And it's a five, almost a five watt charger. It's not going to be the fastest charge in the world, um, but for AirPods, it would actually be fine. So just yeah. I mean, this is not something you're going to do very often, but it's an option that you have with, the, and it's one of those examples of with USB C on the iPhone comes greater flexibility um it's just can also be more confusing because it's more things to know about and to think about and stuff like that no so. kidding the confusing part is what getting me okay so which which kind of adapter comes with the iphone now jeff that do you, is a good you, question yeah we should look that yeah. up um i'm gonna look it up i right wonder now if they talking. have the 30 watt because i know that the 30 watt i feel like that the 30 watt i think i'm looking at the picture here from from uh from zach that that that's the one that came with my ipad i think like it's obviously a little bit bigger than the smaller one there um 
And then I have one that came with my MagSafe Duo adapter, and that I think is a 30 watt because it goes in USB C into Lightning, you know, for the MagSafe, which of course they don't make anymore. But I do like I do like the fact that um, you know, the the conclusion of this article here is that even though the 30 watt is going to to do the the best in here, he says the 30, 30 watt power adapter technically wins the race. But, you know, like you said, the 20 watts a little bit smaller and maybe you prefer to maybe travel with that or throw it in a bag. And it's not like you're going to tell the difference because it's 10 minutes. Like <laughs> like he says in here, I don't think he goes, I can't really find a time when 10 minutes is going to, you know, add, add you know, add that much of a difference. And it's just maybe, you know, you pick portability over the power on there. Were you able to find it? I was. And of course, you and I both know the answer. You don't get a charging brick with the new iPhones anymore. Remember, <laughs> you just get the cord. That was my it's trick been, question. <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, of course, we all know that it's been a couple of years since Apple shipped those. And Apple's excuse was that it's more environmental friendly because yeah. some people already have a charging brick, so they don't need another one. Well, that's it. But yeah. Yeah, so that's it. I mean, so, that, that's um, the thing, Jeff. I remember the 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 uh, the justification for that was everybody already has mini bricks, but now on this story, we may not have the right brick, right? We may not have <laughs> the one, and so that's what frustrates me. I hear you, Apple. Uh, you know, I'd rather you, you just kind of like come out and be a little more honest about it. You just don't want to put it in. It's it's a it's a cost saving measure, maybe. I don't know. I don't have any inside information, but I'm just assuming because now I might want a better brick. Like I know now I have some bigger bricks that I use with my iPad Pro because I do need some additional power there. But if I have my iPhone 15, I might want to use that same brick. Now I'm kind of like you, I've invested in a couple of Anchor um, you know, adapters, Jeff, that obviously have, you know, multiple uh, right. uh, ports in there. And that's what I really travel with on there. Uh, the GAN chargers and everything. And that's really been fantastic from a, from a portability standpoint. But it's almost like I still like to have, I would like to have one that comes in the box so I could just leave it plugged in maybe yeah. at the office, right? Or at the at the house somewhere. Yeah, I think Apple, for, for, for me, my, my two cents is that I think it's probably okay not to have additional charging bricks because like you say, I tend to have those. I will admit though, that it is fun whenever you get a new device, especially like an iPhone or an iPad, when you get another charging cable, the first thing that goes off in my head is, great, I've got another brand new charging cable. Another because even though cable. I don't necessarily need it right now, I'm going to put right. it in a drawer and you know in a yeah. few months I will. Of course, in my whole household, what invariably happens is a month or two later, one of the kids will come in and say, "Absolutely." You know, they show me their charging cord, Brett, and the end of it is so frayed. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh my God, yep. Like, why yep. are we not on fire right now just looking at this? And so I immediately pull out the new one and hand it to them. So I yes. don't always yes. get to use them myself, but it is nice to have those additional uh, charging cords. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, another little surprise that comes with the iPhone 15s and the Pros as well is I'm so glad you found this link, a new Qualcomm modem, uh, which, you know, I don't have my iPhone iPhone 15 Pro yet, but it's uh, I, I, now this makes me want to have it even more because apparently this new modem that they replace is going to improve 5G performance. And something else he mentioned in here, I think, is that it's e it, it switches quicker between your 5G, like if you're walking in the house, you know, to your local Wi-Fi, right? And apparently that new modem is very helpful on that. I, I'm very interested to see if I, do you notice any improvement? Have you noticed any improvement, Jeff? So, you know, whenever you get a new device, you never know when you, you feel like things are going better and you never know how much of it is legitimately better and how much of it is just your excitement for the new device and how much <laughs> of it is just because it's faster and everything Sh else. Shiny new thing. <laughs> but I will admit, before I saw this report, there were a few times when I thought to myself, gosh, you know what? It seems like I'm getting better cellular than before. I mean, really? again, okay. whether it was real okay. or not, it was just in the back of my head. And so when I saw this article, I'm like, well, maybe this has something to do with it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm – I'm in my office right now and I'm like, you know, almost 50 stories up in the sky. And so cellular right. connections are horrible up here. And yeah. I just ran a speed test while you were starting. So I turned off my Wi-Fi and I see that I'm still getting like 9.9 .9 down, which sounds horrible. Okay. Nobody, nobody would want to have that in their phone. But for, for me <laughs> up here in the sky, that's actually pretty good. That's not bad. So, um, right. I'd have to look through my history to see what I had been getting in the past. It's been a while since I've tested it up here. Um, yeah. So yeah. it doesn't surprise me that this is true. And again, it also could just be because the processor is faster. Um, what I find particularly interesting about this story is is what's not said in the story, which is the backstory. And yes. I'm sure some people know this, but Apple desperately wants to make all of the important parts of the iPhone <laughs> and the iPad yes. and the Mac 
Yes. So Apple makes their own chips. Apple has their own design. Yes, they do. Apple does yes, so many do. things on their own. And the one thing that they've been trying to do for years is do their own modems. And years ago, they actually purchased from uh, Intel, Intel's modem division. So it's now Apple's modem division. And, you know, they did it so many years ago that I'm sure Apple had assumed that by now in 2023, they would not have to rely on Qualcomm anymore. But the reality is that uh, it hasn't worked. There was one iPhone a couple years ago that had both a Qualcomm and an Intel modem, and the one with the Intel modem didn't work as well. Um, Qualcomm continues to just do the best job on modems, and so Apple continues yeah. to use them. And I know that Apple hates it because there's been litigation between Qualcomm <laughs> and Apple, and they really don't want to have to rely upon them, but, but the they best. are the best. Right. They are the best. Right. And Apple, you know, as smart as Apple is, and as much money as they have to hire engineers, they have not cracked this nut yet, and so Qualcomm still makes the best. Wow. So it's so the fact that we have a better That's Qualcomm modem and that Apple is not advertising it, this is just a little conspiracy theory on my part. It, but it wouldn't surprise right. me that the fact that they're not announcing it is because they don't really want to <laughs> congratulate Qualcomm for doing a better job when that Apple would love to be doing it themselves. But but it but it does seem to be an advantage that you do have a little bit better performance with the new iPhones. Well, I will conspire with you, my friend, because when I read this, I'm like, wait a minute, I ne I, I, Apple didn't make any mention of this nope. that I can recall anywhere. And sure enough, in the very last paragraph here in this story, a, uh, he says Qualcomm's X70 modem is also what powers many flagship Android smartphones. And then he does link, apparently they reported on this, that iPhone will continue to use Qualcomm chips through 2026. And the headline just, says, as Apple designed 5G modem faces delays. So huh. I don't know if it's a conspiracy. I mean, I'm happy to flame the uh, yeah. fan the flames on that, but that's really interesting that at least for a couple of more years, Apple has conceded that they're gonna continue to work with Qualcomm. Interesting. And I, and I can't remember what year they bought the Intel modems, but it's been a couple of years ago. So if they're committed through 2026, that's like Apple saying, you know, we're buying a whole division that we're not going to use for what, at least five years, if not more. I mean, that's, I'm sure it's smarts. I'm sure a lot of people I, at Apple do not like this headline. Yeah, it is it is. I want to so. dig deeper now because I, I would I would think a processor <laughs> would be more difficult than a modem. Obviously, I have no engineering background. So, you know, I am talking kind of basically out of my ear, but it just I just can't imagine that they haven't been able to do that yet. But okay, thanks for the conspiracy uh, check. Yeah, on this. I, I'm I, just on the press it. release. It was in well, 2019. Uh, well, well, <laughs> it was in 2019. Yes. By the way, is when Apple 2019 they were buying it. So here we, it's already been four years later, and they haven't used it. And and you've just shown that it's going to be another two years, and they're still not going to be using it. So wow, interesting. Mm. All right. So while Apple is working on the inside of the phone, you might want to pay attention to the outside of your phone. I'm glad that you linked to this because I, I forget that Apple does have a whole page on how to clean your iPhone, <laughs> which, you know, most most of the time, I mean, I keep it in a case most of the time. And so I wipe it down. I got a nice cloth that I wipe. In fact, I think I have an iPhone JD uh, cloth still over all these years. Hey, Jeff, if you, you remember <laughs> that you used to have those cleaning cloths. Uh, but I do like the fact that it's it's good to remind yourself they've got, they've got the first section up here that if you have an iPhone 15, 14, 13, 12, or 11, uh, they got some really good ideas on what to do, <laughs> like yeah. unplug all the cables, turn off your iPhone first. Uh, they do, you know, caution, like you're not gonna wanna use what there's a couple of things on here. Don't use compressed air. You know, that don't was the use one that cleaning. Out of me. Yeah, I could see right. People thinking, oh, compressed air. I'll I do clean, that. Clean, clean out my slots, but right. Apple says no, not to use it. So interesting. I know. It, you know, the thing is, what I thought of immediately is I use that. When I use compressed air when I'm cleaning out, well, for me, it's the old lightning port, right? Because I don't know if you've done this before, Jeff. Maybe we've talked about this before, but I, I remember when my father came a, a few years ago to that, to, and he, he kept complaining, he's like, I'm gonna have to get a new iPhone. I gotta get a new iPhone. I'm like, why? It's not charging anymore. It's not, it, it's not charging. And, and I'm like, but everything else is fine. You know, I go in and I check the battery life and it was fine. But you know what this is, you know where I'm going, right, Jeff? Like I looked in the lightning port and sure enough, in this case, what I did, cause I've read up on this, although I don't see any mention of a toothpick <laughs> here in Apple's cleaning. I took a toothpick, which is not metal, right? But it's a toothpick and I put it into the lightning port and I was able to pull out what was, it, it, it's a little disgusting, but yeah, it's really. pocket lint. It's basically what uh -huh. it comes down to. It's pocket lint. Cause you know, people put it in their pockets all the time and things just get, 
in there. And then as you keep putting the lightning cable in and out, you're like mashing it all down into the mm -hmm. bottom on there. Yeah. And sure enough, I cleaned it out, Jeff. And what do you know? It was like, <laughs> my dad was like, like, this is amazing. It's working. Thank you for fixing it. And I'm like, I'm here for you, pops. Uh, yeah. It's good stuff. But I mean, I don't see that they mentioned that here. But, you know, I do like the fact, obviously, it's good to, to um, just use a lint-free cloth, for example, like one from iPhone JD, if you have any more there. <laughs> uh, avoid getting moisture in the openings. Don't use cleaning products unless you're following the instructions for disinfecting your phone. Now, this page also has some other instructions. If you have an iPhone 6, how far do they go down here? Oh, they go all the way to an the, iPhone the 3G original. original. <laughs> yeah, and you know, which means okay, I think good. they're going, you know, all the way to the ones that are maybe still supported because uh, the original iPhone wouldn't be. But uh, lots of good advice here. You and I have joked in the past about the Apple Watch cleaning page because it always yes. talks about putting it under running water. And under sort of running water. That always just seems funny that you do that. But um, but it is, I mean, some of this is common sense device, but it's, it's good to know that if you do want to clean it, like for example, oh, yeah. the fact that it now has aluminum on the outside, does that change anything about cleaning it? And, you mm. know, Mm, it doesn't yeah. really, but it's it's nice to look that up. This reminds me of something else. I was listening to a podcast the other day. I'm pretty sure it was the Mac Power Users podcast. And um, David Sparks was interviewing a, a professional photographer um, whose name is the tick up to my tongue and I'm forgetting it. But oh, yes. One of the questions that David asked was, what are your, like your top three tips for taking photos with your iPhone? And his number one tip, this totally surprised me, was to wipe off your lenses before you take a picture. He says, you'd be surprised that, you know, people oh. have smudges on their lenses. Yeah, like, fingerprints you know, even, He goes, stuff. obviously, if you have a cloth, you can use that. But even if you just wipe it on your shirt, he's like, you'd be surprised at the number of times that people don't realize that there's a smudge on their lens and it totally affects the quality of the pictures that they take. I have to admit, Brett, I never think about that either. Interesting. So the next time that you take out your iPhone, especially if you're taking like a portrait photo or something that you, you know, it's like, I really want this to be a good one. Just, just pay attention to, to the lenses. Um, it's, I thought it was an interesting tip. And of, and of course you can use a lens cloth or in a pinch, you can just use your shirt. Of course, yeah. But, um, it looks like that was Tyler Stallman. Is exactly. the, uh, was the guest that David that was a had really good on. episode yeah, by I, the way I have, it, I have it bookmarked you haven't listened to it yet it's it's great no. he did a fantastic video and in fact we I think we talked about it a week or two ago where he had a video review of the iPhone from a photographer's perspective and he was showing all sorts of cool things like for example one of the things he showed in his video is that with the new 5x lens um if you get yeah. on action mode which is the video mode for the iphone where it like really stabilizes everything he was showing these right, cool right. effects like he was in i don't even know where he was but like let's say you're in rome or something and there's this really cool statue he was like walking almost even running around the statue from different directions just holding an iphone and you're thinking well of course the iphone's going to be jumping up and down but with the action mode on it stayed very calm very steady and the um Interesting. The, the, the effect of having like a statue that just in this little video, you sort of come around it from a different angle. It was a pretty cool effect. It was almost like a professional documentarian effect. And it's something that any of us can do. I mean, how many times have you been on a family vacation and like you, you encounter something like a statue that you want to take a picture or a video, in, in this case, a video of, and it's sort of right. interesting to give it a little 3D effect. So, but if you didn't do that with the, now he points out that the image stabilization is huh. so good on the iPhone that even if you don't have action mode, it's pretty good. But when you're in 5X Zoom, <laughs> good. because right. you are so zoomed in, you know, it's going to really, you know, any hand motion is, is going to have a big effect because there's such a, a zoom in effect. On, and of course, this is just on the iPhone 15 Pro Max. It's got the 5X Zoom. So um, so action mode is something to right, use there. Right, but anyway, right. that, that's kind of rabbit hole. My point is he went very deep on a lot of photography things that I would not have thought about. And it's a good episode uh, to check out. Well, while you're on photography, uh, there was one thing that you uh, mentioned at the very beginning of your uh, uh, post today. Let, let's, mm -hmm. let's just talk about that real quick because I thought this was I – ha I haven't read the entire article because at, within like the first eight paragraphs, I'm like, oh, wow, you know what? I want to take some time to really understand this. One of the things that I've heard – I am not a professional photographer by any stretch, Jeff, as you know, but mm -hmm. I've heard – Photographers talk about raw and log and LUT and HEIF, <laughs> that they call it, H-E-I-F. I mean, so many of these things that I know, if I had time, I would love to learn more about this kind of stuff. But, you know, sometimes I just need to know some of the basics there. But one of the first things that you, you mentioned today were some really interesting articles here. Log is the pro and iPhone 15 Pro. Uh, this is a blog called Pro Lost by Stu Mastwich, it sounds like. Um, thank you for linking to this today, Jeff. I just really think this is gonna be 
one of the best articles that I have found that really maybe better understand what log means and what LUTs, <laughs> L-U-T, what LUTs are for me. So uh, yeah, I, I've got some airplane reading for the later today. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. And a lot of it's above my head. Um, I'm not a professional photographer or videographer. And so I don't need to know this stuff. And, you know, you don't need to either. But <laughs> right, if you're just right. curious, um, it's the, the new iPhone has some real interesting capabilities, you know, recording video directly from the iPhone to an external SSD drive uh, is useful for a lot of people. I mean, if, if you know that you're going you to immediately about that, right? take a video yeah. recording and then immediately hook it up to your computer, that might be, although you can now have a faster connection to your computer thanks to the USB-C, as we talked about a few minutes ago, um, if you record directly to an external device, you could just plug that into your computer and start working with it. So that's good for a lot of people. But if you're a professional, you want to record in this long format. And when you do it, it much like a, if, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture that's that's uh, when you take a photograph in raw, when you first look at the picture, it actually looks pretty crappy. It looks like yeah, very here's flat. here's a, a version on the on this on this story here, which exactly. is really it looks horrible. I'm like, yeah, I would the, never want a picture like that. But right. Go ahead. But what you're missing <laughs> is that because you took it in raw, all that that means is that the iPhone didn't try to bring all the color out and it's going to leave it. Yeah. It's just going to preserve all the details so that you can do that later in Photoshop on a computer or whatever your your program of choice is. And so uh, it's the same is true with video. When you record in this long format, you get these flat looking videos that I mean it looks like there's there's no color depth yeah, at all it's all gray then, it's, it looks terrible apply, huh? what you do is you apply to it one of these lookup tables l-u-t a lut LUT. and yeah you can control like I want you to convert this much of the you know the grayness whatever oh. to a blue and I want yeah. this much of an intensity yeah. of blue or this much not of an intensity of a blue okay and so the article okay. does a good uh you just had it if you go down to the one that has the woman sitting in the chair and it's got the yeah models, this was um, great picture for here. anyone looking at the video you can tell that there's nothing like every single one of this picture is divided into one two three four five six seven almost into yeah. eight different frames and if you were to look at any just one of these frames there's nothing inherently wrong with it. I mean, each of these is a perfectly appropriate way to view this scene, but the colors are a little different. You know, the wall looks a little bit whiter or a little bit more yellow in some of the things. And so- yeah, I would even say warmer just, and brighter. Warmer, like, I, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so the idea is each one of these is set just from a different LUT. And so if oh. I'm a professional videographer and I'm using, you know, four different cameras, I want to make sure that all of my cameras are color coded, that it's the same LUT so that I can switch from different angles and not have the background oh. look different as I switch from one okay. to the other. Um, okay. So that's good if you have multiple cameras. But even if you just have one camera, you may know, and, and we see this all the time when we go to the movies and, you know, professional videographers, you know, I want this scene to be a little bit warmer, you know, because maybe it's in the desert and I want to have right. this feeling right. of being hot or I I want this one yeah. to be a little a little bluer because it's supposed to be a snow theme and it just makes you feel right. cool. And so these are these artistic decisions that I admit that I would very rarely go to the trouble of thinking of them for my pictures. But if you want to think about this stuff, Apple's now giving professional photographers and videographers the ability to make these decisions and to apply these sets. So um and as I sort of concluded my Incredible. beginning. What's neat about all of this is I love that the pros are going, they're so excited about this. And even though I personally am not going to use these effects, I, I have no doubt that as Apple pays attention to these high-end details, it definitely filters down into yes. the, the preset decisions that Apple right, makes right, for the rest right. of us. So, you know, the video that I take of my daughter playing basketball may not have that same incredible look that if the person that wrote this blog post had taken it using, you know, uh, all of these logs and LUTs and everything else, you know, he might have a richer end video than I would ever be able to achieve. But the fact that Apple is providing tools to pros, uh, I'm, I'm sure makes it that the the, the stuff that's available for the rest of us gets better along the way too. The same way that you know car manufacturers show off their their concept cars, not because anyone's going to buy the concept car, but because it just shows off what they can do. <laughs> what they can and do, then right? Over time, right. those features sort of filter into the cars that the rest of us buy. So, um, and so, so it's again, I'm not going to use this stuff, but I really did enjoy reading about it. And and yeah. as you said, Brett, it's it's good plain reading. It's just sort of you know to understand what's going on here. <laughs> Just to be in the know, which is, just hey, which works out good. <laughs> you know, but for me, it's just more FOMO. Like, I feel like if these yeah. tools are there, Jeff, I should be using them or I should maybe, know how to use them. And the thing is, you can. <laughs> I mean, if you want to try it out one day, true, you, to true. you totally could. So, you know, it's... Uh... 
All of that being said, though, and I think I think uh, Stu here does a good job of even saying this. You know what? And, and to your point too, Jeff, you've made the same point. You don't have to worry about this <laughs> because yeah. the iPhone right now, as it stands, you know, almost any iPhone that you have, certainly from 12 and up or so, it's going to do a good enough job that you are going to be happy. <laughs> like yeah. I said, it's just maybe from a nerdy perspective, I feel like there's a little bit of FOMO there. But for the most part, for every, for, I can't tell you that I can find a picture <laughs> that I've taken in the last three or four years and I, and I look it up and I'm disappointed with it. In fact, I'm usually impressed with it just because it took an, on the iPhone and the iPhone does all the computational. I like what he says here. Uh, the candy coated punch <laughs> that Apple <laughs> puts into those those pictures on there. Anyway, okay, I'll make sure that we link to that in the show notes because it is a really great article. I just thought I, I like his style and the way he writes, and I'm like, I really have a good uh, concept now of what that means. So thanks very much. And one last thing Let's I'll say move. about that, Brett. Yeah, it, just, it, yeah just, it reminds me that you know I think about it in terms of my kids because you know as a parent you're always taking pictures of your kids. Pictures. When my right. kids were you know babies long ago, I still had a standalone high definition video camera that was made by Sony <laughs> right. or somebody like that that I used to yeah. use to take videos because I right. knew that I was going to want to have really good videos of them when they're kids when they were young kids and of course now that they're teenagers you know you, you look back at those days fondly when they were much cuter but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the day when you needed to have your own video camera, that ended right. long ago. I mean, the oh, original yes. iPhone, I don't even if it, know if it took much video, but there came a time years ago where video on the iPhone surpassed an external video camera. So nowadays, oh, yeah. unless, unless oh, yeah. you truly are a professional video person, the iPhone's the better choice, period. Yeah. That, that happened yeah. years ago. And we are already at the point with the camera where – um, you know, people used to have their own camera for many, many, many years. I used my DSLR camera from Nikon, which took beautiful pictures, but was yep. you had to, you know, fiddle with the aperture and the everything else. And it was sometimes a pain. And <laughs> if I wouldn't have the setting right, then the pictures would come out horrible because I had, it was, oh, it was a little above yeah. me because I'm not a professional photographer. And I feel like we're getting to the point now, I still own my DSLR camera and I haven't been using it for the last two years, except for exceptions, oh. because even though there are some Sometimes I can get better picture. Like what I used to say is if I really wanted to zoom in and now with my new iPhone, I've got the 5X zoom on it. It's, um, you know, we're getting, to, I think we're pretty much at that point where there's nothing wrong with having a standalone camera. If you want to play with it, go for it. But I don't know that you really need it. I think that your smartphone camera, yeah. if you have a yeah. new iPhone, is good enough. And and so, you know, that's just something that I've seen a transition happen over the lifetime of my kids. Um, and it makes me curious, you know, what's going to be the next 10, 20 years where the the power that we get in taking photography and video with our smartphones is, is just going to be far be Like you wouldn't even yeah. think about using it unless you were, you know, James Cameron making the next Titanic or something like that. So <laughs> it could happen. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move to iOS 17. One article you linked to today was focused on, well, a, a very large focus. I tell you what, Glenn Fleischman is always amazing oh, he's in great. what he does. But he is focusing on the check-in feature uh, in iOS 17. I didn't have a chance to read all of this, but I am very interested in how check-in is going to work uh, for iOS 17 and the iPhones today. Yeah, I mean, the quick version of it is if you're in a situation where let's say that, you know, you're going to be driving home at night and it's rainy out and something like that, um, or you're going to be going through a neighborhood that's a little questionable or maybe not you, but somebody else that you know, if the person's okay. about to do this and, you know, you just it's nice to just sort of check in with somebody else. You know, I got home safe and we, we've, we've all had that situation before where sure. it's horrible right. driving out and you get home and you text your spouse and you say, I made it home, just so you know. I had this long trip, and, and then they feel better knowing that you got there. Well, the iPhone can now do that sort of automatically with the check-in oh, feature. Okay. And so okay. when you turn it on, and therefore you can take a friend, you know, like I might, let's just say that you're, you were my friend for the day, Brett, you know, or my family's out, and I'm, I'm going to let <laughs> Brett know that I got home <laughs> safely. I could turn this on, and then you would get it. It all happens within the Messages app, and Glenn does a great job of describing all the details uh, of it. Okay. And, okay. you know, the iPhone knows where I am and where I'm going, and it knows about how long it should take me to get there. And if I sort of go off track, or if I stop moving for a period of time, it will ask me, it will say, Jeff, you know, you're not moving anymore. Is everything going okay? And if I respond to my iPhone and say everything's okay, well, that's fine. But if I don't respond to the iPhone, then the iPhone's like, huh, 
something might be wrong here. You know, maybe, oh, yeah. you know, maybe I was mugged or something horrible like that, or maybe I got in an accident, you know, you know who knows sure. what happened. And it will alert Br Brett, in this case, you, the person that I've chosen, oh, and it'll say, you know, Jeff probably should have been home by now, but he hasn't checked in in a while. And it will tell you, here's where his iPhone currently is, or here's the last place his iPhone was. And, you know, it, it, you're, you're giving up privacy, no question, but, but by, sure. by, 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 by choice you are because you're saying I just want someone else to be able to check in on me. So, um, yeah. you know, it's the sort of feature that I might not, I, I don't know that I, Jeff Richardson will be using it with somebody else. Um, because especially because amongst my family, we all share our location with each other. So I can always sure, tell right. where my wife and kids are, but, um, but I could see an older person or somebody that was going to be in a situation or maybe you're single and it's like, you know what, I'm just going to let my buddy know, where I am and where I'm going. And, yeah. and hopefully it'll yeah. be inconsequential and it won't matter. But just in case it does matter, you have the security of knowing that there's somebody out there that could, that could find you if necessary. Yeah, Apple calls it the safety partner. Like you have to name sure. a safety partner in here. But I remember when Apple was announcing this back in the summer and I immediately, I think a lot of people are like, well, why, why would I need this? Like, I just do uh, track location. I'm the same way, Jeff. We all share it, our, my family. Like, I can check any time, even with my, mm -hmm. my daughter off at college. I'm like, I can check and see if she's even in the dorm room or, you know, she's at the, the gym or, or what. And, you know, when I'm traveling, my wife can able, can track me on here. But I guess I kind of like this. Um, you know, one thing that Glenn shared that, that I did get through here, which I thought was really helpful is he said, you might be familiar with a similar feature in the Uber app. So when I do an Uber, for example, like I can share my trip or I can share this. And sometimes I will do that with my wife just to let her know like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm en route to the, the airport, that kind of a thing. Uh, and Uber introduced that, it said, because a driver, you know, there might be some kind of a of an issue with the driver. And so uh, drivers receive the complimentary follow my ride to protect themselves against potential violence from riders. So when he said that i'm like okay now this this check-in feature makes a little bit more sense mm -hmm. uh in there because i've done that with the uber app and it's just really nice because when i when i uh reserve a car you know come in to get me i can just it just says do you want to share this with somebody and i'm like yeah share share it with my wife um, that'd be great and so now that helped me to better understand where how the check-in on here um and it just looks like that there's a few different options in here, you know, so that, uh, you know, if your iPhone is even offline or when do you want to check in with folks? I, I really think this is interesting. I, I mean, I feel like I want to use it just so that I can get used familiar with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, but, keep in uh, mind, yeah. Brett, you know, the example you were talking about for your daughter, let's say your daughter was doing, doing like a, a 300 mile road trip. And, you know, yeah, yes, right. you could you can currently track her and that's fine, but you might get tied up in something else. And then what happens right. if she, right. she should have gotten to her destination an hour ago, but didn't make yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you affirmatively right. think to look, you don't know. Whereas with this feature, the iPhone itself will say, you know, gosh, this iPhone should have been there by now and it's not there. And it would just sort of send you a little reminder just so you could check in. And, you know, maybe Absolutely. maybe your daughter yeah. stopped for dinner. And again, there's this, I, I, as I keep saying this, there's certainly some privacy invasion. But but again, it's it's it, you get to control this. It's not going to happen unless you turn it on. So it's, you know, something that people voluntarily do just because they like the safety of knowing that someone else well, out there is watching. Yeah. And it looks like here, because Glenn links to the Apple page on how to turn this on, like it can only, it's only one way. Like, in other words, my daughter would have to go to the messages app, which is neat that it goes in the messages app, because mm -hmm. a lot of times she'll, you know, we, we say, hey, text us when you get there. <laughs> but now yeah. she can go in the messages app and, and you tap the little, you know, new message apparently, select, you know, who you want to send it to and say check in. So in other words, she is the only one that can initiate it, right? I can't, exactly. I can't say, hey, you know, make a check in in for my daughter i can track her location because she shared that with me but okay i kind of i kind of like that like that's a little bit of a fail safe on there in other words that you have to actually you know formally initiate it for it to happen yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna have to try that that's that's good from uh let's see what else can we talk about on the iphone uh, how about an iPhone on your wrist? <laughs> this was a neat little. So Lance Whitney, I know I followed for many, many years at PC Magazine. Uh, an iPhone on your wrist, 28 tips every Apple Watch owner should know. I like the way he just, you know, uh, put that up because we've, we've, we have been, we've been talking for several years now that it's not just a watch, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a whole wrist computer that, oh, by the way, it can tell you the time as well. I mean, I'm just continuing, especially now with watchOS um, 10, right? 10 was the last one. I mean, there's just so many new things I'm continuing to discover on uh, watchOS 10, Jeff, that I'm just, I'm loving. Like I'm so much appreciating some of the updates. A lot of these tips that I think Lance put in here, I feel like I knew, but it was a good review. 
Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head with this article. There's nothing, you know, earth shattering in here. And a lot of these are features that have been out for a few years. But uh, he's got, what does he say, 27, 28 of them. This is a nice way just, yeah. just to sort of, yeah, did you know about this? Did you know about this? And some of these are a little dated. Like one of them in here is the the hand washing thing to wash your hands yeah. for 20 seconds. <laughs> that, that was sort of COVID. Feel, we, yeah, that was COVID. Feel, even though we should continue <laughs> to do that, I suppose. I think we all, we have moved beyond timing our yeah. hand washing. Yeah. But um, still, it's just a nice reminder of, you know, when I went through the list, I knew about every one of these and I wasn't necessarily using all of them, but I did know about them. But sometimes it's nice just to go through a list and just see if there's something you forgot about. So uh, it's funny you mentioned that hand washing. I've left it on, even though that, I remember that have was like you a really? COVID oh thing, right? I have. <laughs> but here's the thing, Jeff, because it does make me feel good when I get the little bling, bling, bling like I finished. But here's, <laughs> so I cheat a little bit. I'll, I'll admit this. So I don't wash my, my, I don't actually wash my hands for what is it, 20 seconds? But I've noticed that like if you're in a public restroom and you, and you, and you wash your hands and then you put it under one of those hand dryers, <laughs> for whatever reason, the watch thinks that you're still washing your hands because you know you're you're pushing your hands together and so i'll stay under the hand warmer dryer <laughs> a little bit mm -hmm. extra time just so that i can feel like yes yeah, right apple watch yeah I, I i got it you 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 give me my little happy happy sound on there <laughs> it's good all right the other thing that you link to from apple watch are things that i have to have almost immediately. Where is Harry McCracken posting these little pictures? <laughs> so this was this was a series of little watch faces that Harry McCracken, a long time, very well respected tech journalist, posted on Mastodon. And they are absolutely brilliant. In fact, how does he even say it here? I think he said, I am 100% more interested in the Apple Watch faces now. <laughs> <laughs> since I realized it was possible to create faces of my own. Look at that. Just look at that. That's the Radio Shack TRS-80 watch face with the time on the screen. I am in love with that. Like, where can I get this, Harry? You've got to share these, please. So for, for people that are listening to the audio version of the podcast, what he's done here is you can select a photo to make your watch face, right? Okay. And depending upon the type of photo, uh, <laughs> you can have the effect where the, the the time appears to be like behind somebody's head or behind your dog's head or something like that. So with that right. in mind, what he's done is just by figuring out how to frame the photo correctly, you know, I gotta this, get this. this far over from the left, this far over yeah. from the right, he has yeah. made it either that the, the, the clock shows up just behind the head of, for example, Porky Pig wearing the, uh, that's a famous episode. It's, um, a, a night at the opera, I think, is it called? It's the where, yeah, where you know, yeah, kill opera, the opera wabbit, kill the wabbit, <laughs> exactly. So um, either it's either it's appearing behind his head for some of them, or in other ones yeah. where he has like a TRS eighty or a Newton, he has just oh. positioned the picture perfectly so that the time shows up right on top of the of on the, the of, of the Mac, of, or the Newton. Yeah. So as he's put it out, it so took him brilliant. a lot of time to get his pictures cropped correctly. <laughs> but then once he did, you get these, it almost looks like, you know, the uh, the TRS-80 watch face. And I have to admit, the end results are pretty funny. It's, so, uh, okay, I, I'm, I, you know, I know you wanted to see the picture, but I'm scrolling down here because I want to see in some of the comments, Harry, did you share these? I mean, that's you what can't just do. like, yeah. he, you can't just tease these out. Now he does say this is based on the Apple Watch portraits face. So, so to your point, mm -hmm. Jeff, he's just using the portraits watch, which you can pick any, any, uh, any picture, right, to be the background mm -hmm. here and then he uses an app i never heard of clockology i wonder if that's something um in in, in in fact harry says in one of the comments here because i just bought the new apple watch after not owning one since the very first so this oh. is all new to him so apparently he hasn't had one in a, in a, in a while but i mean oh i'm just i'm so so th these pictures make me happy i love this newton one by the way where it's got like the hand holding it and a hand i mean now i've now on the plane first i gotta read about log and lutz and then i'm gonna sit there playing with my apple watch faces for the entire time i love this yeah and thanks for finding the app i, I had missed that comment so what is it called again clockology was Cl the he well he says clockology now i don't know if he says you have to have that but it probably just helps you to. I'm, I'm going to look up that app. I had not. Heard I know. I, I I'm just going to read through all the comments on here because somebody was asking, like, is it? You know, are you are you loading an album? Like, what is the pixel? You know, measurement on there? Yeah, he says, create a stuff using an app like Clockology is what he says. So yeah, I want to I want to know mm -hmm. if that's something that would be important. And <laughs> I'm like, what else can I do? Like, I needed an Atari 2600. Uh, you know, watch face. I don't even know why, but it just sounds like that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last thing here is a little fantastic video that I got to tell you, uh, I 
know that a while back, Apple came out when they did the Apple Watch and they did, I forget what they called it, like Walk With Me or Walk With The Star, right? In other words, it would be usually famous movie stars, authors, and they would, you know, do basically a walk and they would talk to you, right? I've never done a whole lot of these, to be honest with you. And this is only in the Apple Fitness app. I have, however, very much continue to enjoy the Apple Fitness sessions, even if it's just like on a treadmill, for example. Now, obviously, that's more focus on, you know, doing the fitness as opposed to walking and talking. But I really have enjoyed the fact that Apple is kind of experimenting with this. <laughs> and so when I saw your video called Study With Me from Apple, that was the first thing that I thought of, Jeff. I'm like, wait a minute, you can walk with somebody and, you know, have them talk to you while you're walking and just, you know, have your earbuds in. Uh, I love getting on a treadmill. And even those coaches, they'll a lot of times will talk you through it, you know, pump you up as you're going through. But I never kind of thought about, you know, doing a study together with someone, but it makes complete sense. I know that my daughter, even in college now, you know, they get into like little study groups and we used to do that through school and everything as well. But th this is like an hour and a half video from Apple with uh, Storm Reed, which I know she's a she's a movie star, right? I, I don't know what she's oh, actually, been in, but I'm I think sure. she's no, I think she's just a regular student at uh, University no of way. Seriously? I, thought, I mean, I'm sure that she signed up for this on campus or something like that. But my understanding right, right. is that she's just a student that, you know, I'm sure that they interviewed a whole bunch of people for this. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, whatever. it's a little boring, but it's fantastic. You know, at one point, like she does like the Pomodoro technique, right? So she basically is sitting with you for 25 minutes, then you get up for five minutes and take a break. At one point, I thought she came back with with a beer in her hand, but it was apparently hot sauce because <laughs> she's like literally having a snack, a snack of sardines break, yeah. and taco shells. But I, 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 you know, at first I'm like, this is a little silly and corny. But as I jump through the video a little bit, Jeff, I'm like, you know, that's that's really nifty. Like. I, I'm really excited that they're doing something like this, even if it's just encouraging folks. You know, I mean, it'd be better if you could do it with somebody in real in real life, <laughs> I think. But hey, this is maybe the second best thing if you don't have somebody else to study with. Okay, so the two of the things to pick up on you just said. First of all, what it reminds me of is I've heard people say, and frankly, I actually believe this for myself. Sometimes if you're working in a super quiet place, you find yourself getting distracted. But then you go yeah. to the coffee house where there's a little background noise around you and there's people around you and just somehow I find that I can be more focused and I can be more productive just because there's that slight background noise around me. And that's what this video allows you to do. If you could play this video and then just get your work done, even though you're not staring at the video, you're just hearing some of the noises from it and glancing at it every once in a while. It's sort of, it's it's as if you're in that coffee house atmosphere and there's somebody next to you working and that may help you. And then like you say, it does have the, the advantage of it encourages a break every 30 minutes. So that's yeah. one thing. Um, in terms of the live thing, we talked earlier in the podcast about David Sparks from the Mac Power Users podcast, and he has right. a little, uh, I don't know, a club, you want to call it, that you know you can get access to his to the premium things that he offers, um, which I'm a member of. And one thing that he did, he's been doing it for a while, and I guess I first did it about a year ago, um, just using Zoom. What he does is he has a Zoom call, and a bunch of people dial in. I mean, the last one that I did there may have been 15 people on it. And the idea is at the beginning of the call, we would sort of talk about some nerdy stuff and then we'd stop talking. And then everybody just sort of mutes themselves and you just do your work. But you, the idea is that you would keep the Zoom window onto the background just because you see all these other people working. And, you know, I actually, it was interesting because, I mean, I'm usually do a pretty good job of staying on task at my work, but the right. idea that I'm sitting here working on my brief and I can see people on the side doing their work too, it sort of encouraged me to keep working and keep working. And then at the end of the session, we all just sort of take a break and then talk for a minute or two and then it was over. And so that, like you said, that was a live thing and I've only done it once, but it actually, it was sort of interesting. I, I could see the advantage of it. So it's something that I had never thought about before David Sparks did it. And now we've got Apple releasing videos on it. And um, it's just another yeah. one of the ways to sort of trick your brain into staying on focus and, and I think having it's great. good techniques. I, I, I hope that Apple releases more of these. I think it's a great idea. I really do. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I like it. And I, I was right. She is, she is a student. <laughs> But she is also a an actor. I knew I had seen oh, her somewhere. Okay, okay. She was in. Let's see. What was it that I saw? Oh, A Wrinkle in Time was one of the things that she did. And there apparently, she go. had a okay. small role in The Last of Us. She was like one of the friends in uh, The Last oh, of Us. There. You so I knew. I, I, love that show. I knew I had okay. seen her. And apparently, she has the same birthday as I do. So hey, I, oh. I got you, uh, <laughs> my sister. That's uh, that's that's fantastic. All right. Good stuff on uh, on that. Uh, 
So yeah, I'll link to that study with me featuring Storm Reed from Apple. In the know. In the know. So earlier this week, I was at a conference, Jeff, and I was actually with folks that are uh, fans of the podcast, which thank you again. But mm -hmm. I was sitting next to one of the gentlemen, Michael Eisenberg, who actually has a very good podcast for he does. Uh, called Tech Savvy Lawyer. Um, and so <laughs> uh, I, I, I like Michael. Hi, Mike. Hi, Michael. Uh, but he got out uh, an actual physical business card and he was going to write his cell phone number <laughs> on the business card to give to me because we were going to text back and forth as we were at this conference. And I'm like, w wait a minute. I, I happen to know Michael. I, I would say he's, he's, he's an, an Apple nerd and uh, I don't think he would take offense to that. I mean, he, he was wearing a Scott E vest for crying out loud, which I just think was so very <laughs> cool. So it's like, I'm like, wait a minute, wait, 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 you have iOS 17. I know you have upgraded. And I have upgraded to iOS 17. Let's exchange contacts. And he was getting ready to like open his contact app. And I kind of was too. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. I know that there is a new thing in iOS 17. And now I do know officially that Apple calls it name drop, even though I have officially called it the wobble, the iPhone wobble. <laughs> because here's the thing. I mean, we knew how this was going to work and I just had never had an opportunity to do it. So I started getting very excited, Jeff. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You just, just hold your phone here and I'm going to hold my phone on top of it. We're just going to like touch the phones as if we were doing an airdrop. And sure enough, it takes like a couple of seconds. So you have to kind of stay there, right? Because it doesn't do it immediately. But in about two to three seconds, it's like your screen just melts into like, you know, Terminator 2 style. I mean, it just kind of like, I call it the wobble. It's hard to explain. In fact, I think Apple tries to explain it here as glow emerge, <laughs> which makes no sense to me. But okay, you know, that's, that's a fancy Apple speak for it's a wobble. It's like your screen melts away. And sure enough, within another second or two, you now have shared your contact info. In fact, it pops up on, I think Apple, yeah, this is the screen you get. So it has the name of the person that is sharing the contact with you. And you have two options. You can just receive their contact info, which means that it will create a contact for you. You don't have to type in anything. You don't have to like, you know, tap around and what is the phone number? Was that 316 or, you know, mm -hmm. or the other option is the share button, which means that you will receive the contact from the other person and you will share your contact info with the other person. Jeff, it worked brilliant. I, I mean, it, uh, people were starting to stare because when that happened, I would just, you know me, I get so excited. I'm like, look, look at this happen. This was so great. And people were like, hey, we're trying to eat here, you know, for our rubber chicken. Like, let's, let's keep going. But it was so it's so fluid. I mean, almost literally, it was so fluid in the way that it worked, Jeff, because it was it, I, it was just so seamless. I had his contact. He had my contact. Now, we did a little bit more experimentation and just to make sure because, you know, you can select which piece, pieces of your contact info that you want to share. Uh, you know, this is getting involved with your contact card and what picture that you want to have on there. So, you know, in this case, we just wanted to share, I think, just our mobile numbers, but he mm -hmm. also has a business number. So I did have to go in and uh, um, I, I added that, you know, but the contact card was already created. I mean, that was the great thing about it. And then, of course, we sat there for another 30 minutes just calling each other back and forth, you know, to see what the contact card looked like and everything. Um, this will only work if you have airdrop turned on and now in ios 17 if you go into settings you might just want to check this i think it's turned on by default but if you have turned off airdrop in the past you might want to go and check go to settings go to general and you'll see airdrop there now you can see that airdrop is the old typical options of receiving off or contacts only but now i think this is new in ios 17 at the bottom it says start sharing by and you can toggle on the option that says bringing devices together. So this yeah. is how you swap numbers with name drop, share photos and more by holding the top of your iPhone close to another mm -hmm. iPhone. Um, I, you, your Wi-Fi has to be turned on, your Bluetooth has to be turned on and the AirDrop has to be enabled. 
on your phone. But I would just encourage you that if you haven't tried this yet, find somebody in your family or close circle of nerdy friends that has already upgraded to iOS 17 and try the iPhone Wubble. I mean, it's just really nifty. And I just cannot wait until this gets a little more standard, Jeff. <laughs> uh, I wish I was closer to you because I would have done it with you you know, early on. But uh, thank you, Michael, for being my, uh, my uh, Wubble guinea pig on doing that. And uh, I would just encourage folks, you know, try it out because it really is cool. It's just a much, much better way to share contact information today. Yeah, cool stuff. I look forward to trying it out. Um, I have seen that got that wobble effect though, and I I appreciate the fact that you were having difficulties describing it, but it gives it is one of those things that you sort of need to see and in fact feel too. Doesn't it vibrate your phone? You got to experience you, it. Yeah, you yes, experience it does. It, it does. So um, the wobble <laughs> effect. So my tip of the, the wobble. Week, yeah, <laughs> my tip of the week. Of tip of the week is Stage Manager. Stage Manager on the iPad has been around oh, for a okay. couple of years now. I know that you have been using yes. it for a while now. I did I not have. use it before a couple of weeks ago when iPad OS 7 I remember. came out. Because when I tried it in the past, I don't know, it just something about it just didn't seem to work for me. There was too rigid and the, it only let you put put multiple windows in certain positions and they right. seemed awkward to me. Right. I turned it off. That's right. I kept my I kept my iPad in full screen mode and I never never looked back. But then when the beta <laughs> period was going on this summer, Brett, I heard people saying, hey, if you haven't it's better. You know, even if even if you wrote off stage manager, give it another try. So I'm like, okay, okay, I'll try it out. Let's see what all the fuss is about. And I haven't turned it off again. I really enjoy it. <gasps> now, I mean, because you can put you're on a board. window you're in on stage. essentially <laughs> I'm on stage in essentially infinite <laughs> positions, it's it feels like a like a regular computer, a PC yeah. or a Mac. I can basically yes. control what what yes. size I want my window to be. And I know that it's not truly infinite. I mean, there are it'll it'll move it a little bit up or a little bit down, but for all intents and purposes, it's every possible right. window size that I would want. And so the advantage of Stage Manager is it allows you, just like on a, on a computer where you might want to be able to see another window peeking behind your current window, and you can very easily swap between them, um, it's the same idea. Yes. And so I, you know, sometimes I have two windows, sometimes I have four, um, yep. and I actually have found that it's made me more efficient. Now, there's one situation in which it has infinitely changed my life, which is – I Do use tell. an app on my iPad, call, and not a lot of people are going to have this example, but I use an app called Log Me In, where I can, uh, it's yep. like a virtual desktop. And so I right. can take my work PC desktop and I can see it on my iPad. So if I'm out of the office and I want to do something on my work computer, I can quickly do it. Um, Log Me In is incredibly security conscious. And so if you are using the Log Me In app and then you switch to a different app, you've got about five seconds before it logs you out of your computer for security oh, reasons. Okay. Um, so that's when you're in the normal mode. But when you're in stage manager mode and you have one window on top of the other, uh, your iPad considers both windows or even three oh, windows. If you got three, they, it considers all active. of them to be the frontmost window and yeah. active. And so I can stay logged in. And so this is great for me. So for example, <laughs> sometimes at home, I will be using my iPad as a lawyer. We do time entry, you know, you got to record your time. And so I'm, I'm putting in the rest of my time entries at night and I will have an app that I use called iTimekeep to enter my time. And then yep. I'll have log me in. Um, and I have one on top of the other and, and, and then my email too, because I might be looking at my emails to remind myself that I sent so-and-so an email and, and I want to bill 0.1 hours for that or whatever. And so I'm switching between all these different apps. I stay logged in to log me in because it's, it's, it considers itself active, but I'm switching between it and my time entry and my email to, to put together my day and sort of recreate that I spent this much on this task and this much on the other task. And it all works seamlessly. And because I can see the different windows, it's easy for me to just tap and move between them. Um, so that's like an extreme example with log me in. But even if you're doing other things, other tasks where you might want one window to be much, much bigger and one a little yeah. bit smaller and you're sort oh, of yeah. switching back and forth. And again, we all know this because we've done it on our computers for, for decades right. now. Right. But, um, it actually works well. And I don't use it all the time for Yay. some of my apps. I actually if you extend out the app enough, you can extend it so it's completely full screen. And then it's just like the old days. Right. Or exactly. For some of my apps, I extend it that it's almost completely full screen it covers everything except yeah. for the bar at the very bottom because exactly. that way I, I it just makes it more easy for i don't have that it doesn't have to worry about it appearing and disappearing i could just easily switch between apps using the bar at the bottom and it yeah. just depends upon the yeah. app that i'm using what setup i have but i I, I, I'll be honest with you, Brett. When I started it again, I only did it because people said you got to try it out. So yeah. you know, I got to got to eat my vegetables and see that you know what this is all about. And then once I started using it, I'm like, 
this works. This Yay. makes sense. So um, if you find yourself ever doing things on your iPad where you switch between you switch back and forth between apps, then just pause for a second and think, wait yeah. a minute. Should yeah. I be using Stage Manager when I'm switching yeah. between apps? And if you don't do that, if you only use one app at a time and you never think about two different apps, well, that's fine. You don't have to turn mm. it on. But um, yeah. it, it, there's pages in the Apple website that, that you're showing right here that you can yeah. turn, stage, turn Stage Manager on or off. Um, but I, for me, it's really working and it's making me a lot more efficient. A, a couple of things real quick. That's the way we've always used the iPad, right? It was like one app, front and center, taken over the entire screen. And that was right. the beauty of the iPad from the beginning, right? And so when we started having this option for multitasking, what we had, we, we, we call, which is still available, split view and slide over, some of those options there, people were like, okay, well, that's nice, you know, just a, a little bit of a, you know, of, of, uh, of an acknowledgement of some multitasking. But for the most part, we still like using the iPad the way that we did. But it was iOS 16 when Stage Manager first came on, and it was not accepted the best. I got to tell you, I, and, and people might remember this, we've talked about this before, I jumped on the bandwagon, and I loved it, because I do like having the ability to move the items around. Uh, Frederico Vitici, of course, on Mac Stories, I mean, that just gentleman has done probably the most writing on anything with Stage Manager. And I do remember we talked about this several weeks ago, that he very much liked the improvements with Stage Manager with iOS with iOS 17 from 16. It seemed like it wasn't wasn't huge changes, but even Apple themselves on this page that, that I've linked to here, they they have a drop down here that you can go to iOS 16 iPad OS 16, or you can go to iPad OS 17. Because they really are which different, just, yeah. They are, they, there are some major differences there. So I think to your point, I don't want to steal your tip, but I'm just saying for anybody that that maybe tried Stage Manager a year ago with iOS, iPad OS 16, and you know you turned it off just like you did, Jeff, <laughs> and didn't go back, it might be worth trying. Uh, they have made some very tiny but significant type of improvements in that it is a little more flexible. I do this all the time, Jeff, because I used to do the command tab to switch back and forth between different apps. But I usually have three or four apps open with I'm taking notes and my email behind there. Frankly, even like my Spotify player, I've got it like a very thin little player over on to the far right, just barely showing so I can tap it and hit, you know, stop if I need to from a music standpoint or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, I just love having the options on there. So I'm so happy my friend, that you are now on stage with me. <laughs> Welcome. It's a <laughs> big you. enough stage for everybody. <laughs> good stuff on that. Good, good, good. T stage manager. All right. Okay, that's probably enough for today. Thanks, everyone, for listening. As always, we truly do appreciate uh, you all listening. And hey, if you enjoy listening to us and you've been listening for a while, feel free to uh, send the link on to somebody else or maybe suggest it to somebody. We always appreciate that anytime. Or, you know, even frankly, uh, leave a little review in your favorite pod catcher that you use. All right, my friend Jeff, thanks as always. And we'll talk with you next week. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Brett. And goodbye, everybody. <laughs>